is wild. We have BravoCon coming up and that's going to be a lot. So for those of you that follow Bravo content, we're going to have some Bravo amazingness happening soon. So with that, I will be updating in the, um, in the app when I'm going to be live. Some of those are going to be members only, um, backup, like not backup. Those are going to be like members only behind the scenes back back up, Emily, members only behind the scenes, uh, lives so that you guys get a kind of a full experience of what we're doing. Some of that will be public, but I know not everybody who follows me for the legal stuff wants to follow the BravoCon stuff. So I'm making sure it's where those that want to know what's going on, have a way to know what's going on. And then some of that will just be updated over on Instagram um, and not as much here on YouTube because again, it's it's adjacent to what I do, but I'm really excited. There are lots of housewives that I met last BravoCon that I'm excited to see. I'm, I'm waiting to see how spicy the panel is for Vanderpump. They're dropping the premiere of Beverly Hills like right before BravoCon. And I think that's intentional. I'm, I think we're going to have to do a pre BravoCon episode of the Emily show to catch up on all things Girardi, including a new lawsuit against Erica that I haven't covered yet. I, I feel like the Bravo, like the Bravo court coverage world just makes sense together. I'm doing, um, a little bit of a meetup with the ladies from the Bravo docket. So it's like the pop culture lawyer ladies getting together to just be like, <gasps> Oh my God, this, and I can't wait. There's so much fun. And I, one of the things I really enjoy about getting together with creators is especially the creators who make the effort to go out to in-person events like this. They are genuinely, um, incredibly generous. They are lovely. They want to be social. They want to hang out. It is fantastic. So I love that. Um, I absolutely love that. So when I look at heading to in-person events, it's making sure that the in-person events I am heading to, um, are events where the creators that are going to be there want to also really be in community, um, and want to be in community in a way where they, like being around other creators and having a chat and having some fun. And that is important to me. So I'm really excited about that. I, I can't wait to see what shenanigans pop off. You guys, if you followed my coverage last year, know that Jen Shaw crashed a party and it was a whole thing. I've heard that she's been communicating with some people from custody. I'm interested to hear, um, who is answering those calls and what's going on. So I can't wait for that. Uh, what else? I hope to run into Andy Cohen again this year. It was fun running into him last year. And then there's a lot of housewives that love to chat about the stuff I cover too. And I enjoy it. So I look forward to like being in person. What I'm not quite ready for, what I'm not quite ready for is how long I'm going to be in Vegas. I'm going to be in Vegas a lot over uh, the coming week. There's going to be lots of Vegas. So sometimes uh, Vegas just kills me. There's something exhausting about the energy in Vegas to me. So I'm staying at a new hotel. I normally stay at the same hotel every single time I go to Vegas because it's familiar and I know what to expect. Going somewhere new, maybe this is a me thing. Maybe this is a neurodivergent thing. Maybe this is also a you thing. Going somewhere new and exploring somewhere new and figuring out like the ins and outs of somewhere new is, is also, it also takes energy, but I also want to go to like one of the Vanderpump restaurants there and there's like stuff to do, but going somewhere new takes a different level of energy. So I'm staying at a whole new hotel that takes energy. Um, I've never been to Caesar's Forum where they're hosting BravoCon before. I know they just had TwitchCon in Vegas. Um, so I saw some of the things that have come out of TwitchCon. Um, uh, Miguelina, I will look at that in just a sec because I can't access that yet um, because of emails. So give me one second and I will fix that. I just saw stuff coming out of TwitchCon that, you know, again, everybody was in, everybody was in Vegas. I, 
I was kind of glad I wasn't in Vegas for TwitchCon. That seemed like a lot, um, like a lot of energy and a lot of things. So with all of it, that's what we're doing. I need to put this, hold on, Miguelina. I'm going to put it in our edit folder so you can grab it from there. Um, I have something that's, I've been, I realized because the law nerds pointed out that there was uh, a typo in the thumbnail. So I'm trying to give, give the new thumbnail, uh, though it's also in Canva, Miguelina, give the new thumbnail to Miguelina so she can do it while I'm streaming because that's how things work. But I also put it in our, um, our podcast folder. So, and then I'll deal with that after stream. All right, y'all. I see lots of love for the app. I've seen multiple loves for the app. Loving the app. My senior pawn nerd is so happy. It's Tuesday. He gets to listen to your calming voice. Thank you, Cindy. I love the app too. Um, Bethany, I've definitely done this in Vegas. Uh, sometimes you get into the wrong elevator bay and you don't realize you've gotten into the wrong elevator bay and you end up in a tower you're not supposed to be in. And then you're like, where am I going? Where am I going? Um, we're off to Vegas and have brunch booked for Vanderpump at Caesars and dinner at Vanderpump Paris. My girlfriends are VPR obsessed. That's amazing. Kalo, are you going to be there for BravoCon? That'll be amazing. Um, I'm in Sweden, but the main reason I want to go to Vegas is the lights and the sphere. The sphere looks so freaking cool. It looks so freaking cool. I've, I saw construction of the sphere last time I was in Vegas, but I have not seen it since it's been completed. I'm really interested to see it. Like, I'm really interested to see it. I, um, it's like Halloween time. I want them to put like just one giant eyeball on it, like looking at people on the strip. It seems like it would be really funny. I saw the advertising that Xbox was doing on the sphere during TwitchCon. It seemed really, really cool. I'm I'm interested for how the sphere is bringing, you know, music to a new level. Also, I love standing out in the heat um, as it becomes nighttime with, you know, sweating with 30,000 of my closest friends listening to Dave Matthews. It's a different environment than the sphere, but I could see the sphere being really, really cool. The YouTube concert does look absolutely amazing. Um, but do you have to buy, do you have to buy tickets to the sphere through Ticketmaster? That's my question. For everyone that was on yesterday when I recorded the podcast, you know why I'm asking. Tomorrow's Emily show is covering Taylor Swift and Ticketmaster. It is so much deeper than you think. There is so much more to what's going on with Ticketmaster. Y'all, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So I'm interested to see the sphere. Um, Vegas is going to be Vegasing. I have some favorite places in Vegas. I don't know if I will get to visit them this trip. So we will see. I love the piano bar at New York, New York, but I love a piano bar. I love the I love the mix of like music and sass and comedy. And the crowd there tends to not be 21. No offense to 21 year olds. The 21 year olds tend to go to the club. I um, am not at the club. I am too old to be at the club. Um, I, I, I don't want to pay seven times the amount for alcohol that I really don't want to drink. But I love the piano bar so much. It's an experience. It's live music. It's comedy. It's a sing-along. And it tends to be a crowd that's just a little bit or, uh, older. So that tends to be really fun, too. It's not quite as messy. I have seen some disasters coming out of the club. Though, when I was in Vegas for lawyer conference, they did rent out an entire club uh, for the lawyers. That was a fun club experience. But again, it was all the lawyers that were at the conference. I had a really good time with that. Um, Michelle M. No, since the spinal fusion, there has been no twerking. <laughs> the club needs to do a matinee session. <laughs> I would do that. I would tell that that would be ideal. It's like, can I go to the club at six and then go to a nice dinner and then go to bed? <laughs> I have heard that F1 is making traffic miserable. I actually changed my hotel so that I was on the same side of the strip as Caesar's form so that it would be easier for me to get back and forth. I, yes, I'm, I'm aware. I also worked in Long Beach when they did uh, the Long Beach Grand Prix. So I know exactly, I know exactly what that is like. Um, Jade, no, I don't twerk. 
There is no twerking there anymore. <laughs> was there twerking at a point in my life? Yes, but it was before they called it twerking. It was just me shaking my ass. It just, you know, as one does when they're in their 20s. I mean, I guess I could still do that now. It would just, I would probably hurt myself. <laughs> but anyway, I'm I'm personally attacked by all the memes going around Instagram that are like, um, excuse me, I can tell how old you are by how you dance. Like, put your hands down. The comment section on one of those Instagrams were like, but we were told, we were told to put our hands in the air if we just don't care. And it went through all of the different songs that involve putting your hands up in the air. And people are like, but how, how will I raise the roof if my hands are not up? You know, everybody hand go up and they stay there. Like, how, how do you, it was too funny. Anyway, um, I feel it. I feel personally attacked, but also that's me. I'm really excited again to see live music. So the second round that I'm in Vegas this trip, I will be also going to see Yachtly Crew. And I'm very excited about it because live performance Yacht Rock makes me happy. I've also managed to wrangle a group together to go enjoy live performance Yacht Rock with me. So that's going to be delightful. My only fail in the entire thing is I have to go to the airport the next day and I get motion sick. So I have to ensure that I am a responsible adult because if I get on a plane hungover, it is a mess. I have done that. It is not good. It is not good at all. I'm going to end up like Heather Gay in that freaking sprinter van. I cannot. I cannot. <laughs> so an adult. We have to be an adult. We have to yacht rock adult. Take ginger root pills for plane sickness. See, I can deal with the plane sickness if I have not been an idiot. If I am dumb, then it's bad. Uh, Andrea said, saw Yachtly Crew this weekend. It was wonderful. Aren't they fun? The band is delightful. They're just delightful. I, MB, I don't know how 20-year-olds dance now. I think they just send each other gifts on Discord or something of like, I don't, th I don't know if they actually dance. I don't know. All right. Um, I live in Vegas. Would love to see Yacht Rock with you and your group. We are going to see Yachtly Crew at the Palms. So that's where we will be. Um, when you're not, when you are smart, do you sleep on the plane? It depends on the flight. Um, from like, this is, this is more of an answer than you want, but from, from like Nashville to Atlanta, cause I normally catch, um, connections through Atlanta on Delta, but from Nashville to Atlanta, I generally don't because of the way you land in Atlanta and take off. There's a lot of banking and I, if my eyes are closed, I'm a mess. So no. But like Atlanta to, you know, Vegas is a pretty straight shot. So yes, this trip, there will be no sleeping on the plane. I am going to be listening to the audiobook of Britney Spears' book that came out today because I am in the middle of, of another book that is like 26 hours long that I cannot put down and I cannot, I need to finish that thought and then switch to Britney's book. So my plan for the plane is to listen to Britney's book while I play the Suica game that I am obsessed with. Though when I travel internationally, I have definitely slept on the flight. But again, pretty smooth shot when you're heading across uh, the Atlantic. So I'm really excited for Britney's, for Britney's book. No, she's not narrating. Britney's book is narrated by Michelle Williams. I think it will be great. So you find Vegas has the roughest landings. Yeah, their air is real hot and weird. So yes, Vegas, Vegas can be, Vegas can be tough uh, landing into Vegas. So it's a whole different thing. So that is the plan. My plan is to play the freaking Suica game that all the streamers are playing on my Nintendo Switch on a plane and try to beat my score. Though if I do, I'm going to be sitting in my seat like, and people are going to be like, what? Like, Never mind. I play Nintendo Switch on the plane. Um, unless the plane is turbulent and then the Nintendo Switch might also make me a little motiony when I'm on the plane, which is why I tend to not. I'll play like Pokemon on the plane. I'll play Mario stuff on the plane, but there are times when I am trying to play Zelda on the plane and the game I'm looking around too much and then I'm moving and I'm like, oh God, <laughs> I can't do that. This is how old I am. Me, like just bearing my soul on how pathetically motion sick I get. 
It just is. It just is. Um, let's, I'm going to double check the Idaho uh, docket real quick before I say there's nothing there because you never know. They make things public at strange times. And we're going to go, what's going on in Idaho? And then nothing since yesterday. All right. That's what I saw yesterday. Uh, we're going to go Idaho and then we're going to go to defamation case. Are you guys ready? We're going to Idaho today. Uh, I hope you have your carry-ons. Put your seat backs, you know, in their full upright position. And uh, make sure you've got your noise canceling headphones on. And let's go. All right. Welcome to Idaho. First, we're going to be talking about the Brian Koberger case, and then we're going to be talking defamation. With the Koberger case, there are multiple media requests for a hearing on the 26th. I have not found that notice of hearing anywhere, but I know it's a motion hearing. I just don't know what they're covering. So let's look at what the court has approved with regard to the um, media requests from Idaho, because the court has approved media requests from Idaho. Not everything they've asked for, but there's some approval, and some approval is better than none. How do I close that? I don't know how to do that. There we go. Yay. So this is Court TV's media request. This is a media request to video, audio, record, and broadcast. This is for the October 26th hearing at 1 p.m. Remember, when Idaho does hearings, well, let's just get into it here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a warning while we get into it. The court has granted the order under the restriction set forth for video recording and audio recording. So grants permission for video audio recording for one pool camera. Denied permission to broadcast. Every single time the court has done this, they have denied permission to broadcast the hearing. They have granted approval for one pool camera to photograph. So remember, in Idaho, the court will allow recording that then has to be distributed after the hearing. So this hearing does not start till 1 p.m. Pacific time. So it will be a late one when it gets released. Um, so I will not be covering it immediately because it will be released late. So we will we will just be rolling with it. I'm sure people will be covering it. There is a notice of motion on this hearing to allow Zoom attendance for those who cannot make it in person, the victim's family, defendant's family. The court is mindful that limited courtroom capacity and potential travel restrictions may interfere with the victim's and defendant's family's ability to observe the court proceedings in the case on October 26 at 1 p.m., Therefore, in event they are unable or prefer not to attend in person, the court finds it necessary to make the proceedings available via Zoom. Um, I know some of you in the chat are saying mountain time. The court has said Pacific in this. So what the court has said in this is Pacific. Uh, so I'm going with what the court said. If the court's wrong, they might be wrong. But the court has said Pacific time. So maybe it's at 2 p.m. Mountain Time? I don't know. I don't know. Either way, that's what the court has said here. Therefore, in any event, they are unable or prefer not to attend in person. The court finds it necessary to make the proceedings available via Zoom. So then this has been provided with actual like Zoom meeting ID and passcode and stuff for the families so they can um, they can attend. So I think this section is specific right? So do victims' families have to have their camera on if using Zoom? No. Um, the court, it depends on jurisdiction where the court may have you turn your camera on to, to identify that it's you and that you haven't like distributed the meeting ID, but then no, they don't require you to have your camera on. Um, so let's see. Let us continue on. Um, yes, yeah, specifically Pacific. Exactly. So part of Idaho is mountain and part is Pacific. The courthouse is Pacific. Idaho is split. So that makes, that makes sense. Um, the state has two times time zones. Lots do. Tennessee has multiple time zones. It fucks me up all the time. 
<laughs> there's times I'm planning to do things that I'm like, thank God for my phone. Because when I put in the maps, it says this route crosses time zones or date lines or whatever it says. And I'm like, I think it says time zones. And I'm like, oh, that's right. Like I'll, I'll plan to go down to Atlanta to do something and completely forget that even in my brain, it seems like Nashville's here and Atlanta is directly below it. Atlanta is in Eastern time and I am in Central time. And it confused every single time. I'm like, oh, it'll take me this long. I'm like, oh no, tack on an hour because there's a time change. Because there's a time change. It's so confusing. Jolene, it's not confusing for you because Chattanooga and Atlanta are kind of in the same. <laughs> same, 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 same. Have you tried Suica Halloween mode? Not yet. I'll be doing that later today. <laughs> so Alabama has two time zones. Yeah, it's not uncommon to have multiple time zones, though in California, because it was such a long vertical state, I never even considered it. Um, doesn't Arizona have multiple time zones? I don't know. Anyway. When you're on the coasts, it doesn't really occur to you when you live coastally, because most of the things you do go up and down the coast, not side to side. And you're like, ah, oh, time zones. But in Tennessee, it's like, where? it seems to me like Atlanta and Nashville should be in the same time zone. Oh, that's right. My friends and I got in a fight over this. And then we're going to, we're going to wrap up this case. And you're gonna be like, Emily, you're just chatting. Um, I had forgotten and friends had forgotten that Arizona didn't change time zones. And so there's sometimes when it's the same time as LA and sometimes when it's not the same time as LA. And my friend that lived in Arizona was watching American Idol, the finale, and texted all of us like, oh my God, I can't believe so-and-so won. And we're like, girl, it it's not done airing yet here. And she's like, I completely forgot we weren't on the same time at the moment. We're like, no back when you know we would all watch tv live and things would happen live and you would be like oh, yeah like that <laughs> back in the world before everything was on the internet the second that it happened um other things going on in the idaho homicide case there has been no ruling yet on cameras in the courtroom long term there has not been any um any kind of cohesive ruling on the DNA stuff. There are ongoing discovery motions. There is no new date set for trial. So we're really just waiting. And I'm hoping that the hearing on the 26th kind of reorient us to what is going on in this case, because other than seeing the discovery requests, we haven't seen much time uh, or we haven't seen much happen other than that. So these are all motions from much earlier in October that we had covered, uh, including the supplemental request for discovery. Those are all, the new ones are filed under seal. So there's not much more to be discussed until we get to the hearing on Thursday and see what, see what happens. So with all of that, we're going to go to the Idaho defamation case. And if we zoom, zoom through it, maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to talk about that texting judge from Oklahoma. Let's see how fast we can get through the defamation case. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But let's, let's talk about that for a minute. The Idaho defamation case is probably one of the top cases that I am really invested in seeing how it comes out. This is a case where a professor at the University of Idaho has sued a TikToker for defamation because that TikToker continuously and persistently said that the professor was involved in the university murders that Brian Koberger has since been charged with. Said that this professor is the one who um, hired these murders, organized these murders, asked for help with these murders, had an inappropriate relationship with one of the victims, and that was the cause of the murders. And it is wild stuff. And it really raises the question about when you are not even involved in a high profile case, but this professor just works at the university, seems to not even have had these um, students in class, seems to have no connection with them at all other than it's the same university. What do you do when your place of business becomes kind of the center of attention for a high profile case like this and someone wilds out on you on the internet? Like, what do you do? 
And this defamation case is showing how frustrating it can be going through the what do you do in a case like this. So the professor has sued for defamation. The TikToker is representing themselves pro per in federal court. The TikTok creator uh, has filed motions that have been dismissed. The TikTok creator filed a countersuit against the professor that has been dismissed, tried to sue the professor's attorneys. That was dismissed. Those things have not been refiled. But there were some motions that the court hadn't ruled on yet, and that includes a motion for sanctions and a motion to quash some of the subpoenas. The TikToker was trying to subpoena like everything from everywhere and to go on a phishing expedition into the professor's social media accounts, which is not a proper use of discovery because you're not, the TikToker is not going to find anything in the professor's Facebook account to help her defend the defamation claim. Like what is, what is that going to be? What do you think the professor said on Facebook that's going to help you defend the defamation case? So there needs to be a reason that you are seeking discovery. This very broad subpoena, especially the one relating to the lawyers, seemed like a, no, it was a reach. It didn't seem like a reach. It was a reach. So the court has ruled on those two things. And then the professor has filed a new motion that we're going to go over in this case. So first we're going to the uh, court's order and decision. Then we are going to a motion for summary judgment. The MSJs were literally what I spent so much of my time doing as a research attorney for judges. So the MSJ will take a little bit more of a walkthrough on the law and see in this defamation case, what they're asking the court to decide. And then when the TikToker responds to the MSJ, we will go to that response. So for now, we are going to go take a look at this court's four page ruling on motion for sanctions and motion to quash or modify a subpoena to Facebook. Let's break it all down. All right, let's make this a little bit. Let's embiggen. That's too embiggened. We embiggen. We've gone too far. We've embiggened too much. Oh no. This is the court's order. Pending before the court are two motion, plaintiff's motion for sanctions and plaintiff's motion to quash or modify a subpoena to Meta. The in, in the interest of avoiding delay and because the court conclusively finds the decisional process would not be significantly aided by oral argument, these motions will be decided on the record and without oral argument. So on the motions that have been filed without having a hearing. As discussed more fully below, the court denies the motion for sanction, grants the motion to quash or modify. So let's get into it. This court keeps denying motions for sanctions, but one of these days, man, one of these days it's going to happen. Plaintiff's motion for sanctions. On June 6, 2023, plaintiff moved to dismiss defendant's counterclaims against her. Therein, plaintiff also requested that the court exercise its inherent power to send a clear message to defendant for the rest of this litigation and award plaintiff her attorney's fees spent combating these frivolous counterclaims. On June 13th, plaintiff moved to quash the summons for her counsel, claiming that their issuance was procedurally improper. Before the court resolved these two motions, plaintiff filed the at-issue motion for sanctions, arguing that the court should sanction defendant under Rule 11 by dismissing the purported counterclaims against plaintiff's counsel and awarding plaintiff's costs and fees incurred to bring the motion. On August 8th, the court granted the motion to dismiss insofar as it dismissed the defendant's counterclaims against plaintiff. However, the court expressly indicated that an attorney's fees award against defendant was not warranted. Yet, stating, the court has previously remarked that certain of defendant's conduct after being served with plaintiff's complaint was, quote, off-putting and ill-advised. This is the court calling the behavior off-putting and ill-advised. This is about as strong as I've seen a court come out about anyone's behavior before a final judgment as issued. You're not going to get much more from a judge, or at least you shouldn't, but saying that the behavior of the TikToker was off-putting and ill-advised at least means and should indicate to the TikToker that the court at this point is watching what's going on here and is uh, not impressed and that the other party is right in how they're feeling when they're saying, Your Honor, this is ridiculous. 
Without commenting here on the merits of plaintiff's complaint, defendant's answer, and counterclaims, unfortunately, do nothing to, sorry, without commenting here on the merits of plaintiff's complaint, defendant's answer and counterclaims, unfortunately, do nothing to ally these concerns. But it must be recognized that defendant is not an attorney, and with that, cannot be held to the same standards as an attorney when assessing whether she has acted in bad faith before this court. And the court is parsing out, I'm not saying that this is a strong case for plaintiff or a weak case for defendant. I'm saying that defendant's behavior in this case, since the complaint was filed, that behavior is a problem. And I like that the court clearly parses these things out, but is very clearly indicated to defendant, knock it off. You are on thin ice with the court. For this primary reason, the court declines to levy sanctions against defendant at this time. Additionally, the court cannot conclude with any confidence the defendant has purposely delayed or disrupted the litigation. Meritless counterclaims asserted by a non-attorney do not automatically rise to that level. But, but due to the very sensitive nature of this case and its impact to both litigants and non-litigants alike, the parties are on notice. And the court says the parties are on notice, but the court is mostly talking to one side here. The parties are on notice that the court's tolerance for any disregard of court procedure or basic human decency is limited. I need to start saying this to my kids. My tolerance for shenanigans is limited. Me, my tolerance for basic human decency is, uh, is limited. Um, me to the internet. The court's tolerance for any disregard for court procedure or basic human dignity is limited. Can we all just take that? Like between the like the disregard for basic human, my tolerance for the disregard of human dignity is limited and and we also need like this hyperbole is not helpful or this level of hyperbole is not helpful. Um this level of hyperbole is counterproductive. With this in mind, the court currently, the court's current refusal to assess sanctions against defendant does not foreclose the possibility that sanctions may be appropriate later. Until then, an attorney's fees award against defendant is not warranted. This was the court giving a warning shot across the bow. My tolerance is limited. This is about as close to the court saying fuck around and find out as a federal court will ever say. But this feels like, this feels like judicial for fuck around and find out. The tolerance for any disregard for court procedure or basic human decency is limited. Fuck around, find out. Thus, the relief sought within plaintiff's pending motion for sanctions has effectively been addressed by the court's intervening memorandum on August 8th. Specifically, the court has already decided against a monetary sanction relating to defendant's counterclaims, the premise of plaintiff's claim for sanctions in her motion for sanctions. The court has already dismissed defendant's counterclaims against plaintiff and quashed the summonses for plaintiff's counsel. Plaintiff's motion for sanctions is therefore denied as moot. So this is the court just reminding again the parties that the tolerance is limited. Um, and reminding the defendant that in following proper court procedure, it is not the time to continue to spin out and levy wild accusations. They need to be factually based statements. So let's look at the motion to quash. Uh, the court goes next to the plaintiff's motion to quash or modify the subpoena. Consistent with rule 45 A1D4, defendant served plaintiff with a notice and copy of subpoena she intends to serve on Meta. Facebook, Instagram. Plaintiff moves to quash or modify the subpoena because it seeks information not limited to the defense, not limited to the defenses to claims filed against defendant, but instead broadly requests all messages on the professor's social media accounts, all of the professor's social media connections, all communications between the professor and any University of Idaho students. According to plaintiff, these untailored requests are irrelevant and would unnecessarily invade the professor's privacy. Can you imagine a world 
we've spent time on the internet. We might talk more about internet specific things on a uh, Thursday. I think that's what I'm inclined to do. But can you see a situation on the internet where a internet content creator, a TikTok content creator who has made a plethora of content deriding this professor, harassing this professor, um, accusing this professor of unimaginable things, and then getting giving that TikToker access to everything that professor has on their social media accounts. Can you can you could you see how that could go badly? And I see you guys in the chat. This is exactly what I was thinking. Why are you so obsessed with me? Um, can you imagine how badly this would go? Because I don't think from everything we've seen here that the TikToker has yet appreciated that this is a federal lawsuit and not content. So even though discovery is supposed to be kept within uses for court, I can't imagine that the professor would ever feel safe and secure that the TikToker would not use those things for improper purpose, for content, for the rest of it. Can you imagine how badly this would go? And the court, I think, is doing a good job right now of parsing between, not saying, uh, you can't fucking do that, and explaining why. This would be so bad. This would be so bad. You don't give this person all of the socials. They don't need it for their case. Um, this is a quote from the motion. Gouillard TikToker should not be allowed to further invade the professor's privacy by obtaining pictures of her kids, private messages with friends unrelated to the case, all contact informations and locations captured on her social media accounts. There's no proper use for that information as it relates to TikTokers' defenses to defamation. Defendant did not respond to plaintiff's motion to quash by the court-imposed deadline of August 17th. The responding quote, this is the court quoting the local rule, the responding party must serve and file a response brief within 21 days after service upon the party of the memorandum of PNAs. She instead submitted a response nearly a month later on September 15th. Do you guys remember when she was promising the court that she was going to adhere to court deadlines? Promising the court that she was like doing her best? Being a pro per defendant would suck. Not having money to deal with this would suck, but also... The person who made the choices to make the TikToks and then didn't stop when served cease and desist was the TikToker. She instead submitted a response nearly a month later on September 15th. That response endorsed a modification to the subpoena to meet the requirements of the Federal Stored Communications Act, yet requested the court, yet requested that the court now order Meta to produce the sought-after information. Given the uncertainty surrounding the state of the defendant's current efforts to secure information from Meta and likewise plaintiff's objectives, objections thereto, the court will reorient the procedural land. Oh dear. Oh, oh, oh dear. The court will reorient the procedural landscape to promote a systematic approach to addressing the party's respective arguments. Oh dear. First, the court grants plaintiff's motion to quash or modify and quashes the subpoena. Under local rule 7.1, defendant's failure to timely respond to the motion to quash constitutes consent to the sustaining of said motion. Let me reorient you. You failed to respond. Therefore, you have acquiesced to the request to quash it, the subpoena. So it is squashed. Regardless, defendant no longer appears to be pursuing a subpoena, but rather a court order pursuant to the Stored Communications Act. Second, to the extent the defendant seeks an order from the court, she is instructed to formally file a motion to that end, footnote one. Plaintiff is then permitted to respond to any such motion pursuant to the federal rules and local civil rules, footnote one. Defendant is advised, ooh, your honor, your honor, 
you don't need to advise the defendant of shit. This is generous. Defendant is advised to attempt to first secure any requested information from plaintiff herself through specific requests for production of documents and or a request to consent to the production of content directly from a producing social media site. Defendant is reminded, however, that, quote, only discovery relating to plaintiff's underlying claims and defendant's defenses thereto are permitted. Discovery extending beyond these contours to include requests that are vague, overbroad, and disconnected from pertinent timeframes will not be permitted. You cannot just go fishing for everything. There is a very specific discovery procedure. If you are not familiar with discovery, it would be foreign and disorienting and hard to navigate, but you need to ask your lawyer. Discovery is what lawyers do. This is the time for interrogatories. This is the time for production requests. This is the time to request specific discovery. But as Michelle says in the chat, legalese is hard, bro. So the court has again reminded TikToker, if you fuck around, you will in fact find out. If you miss deadlines, it grants me leave to just grant the motion and you need to go through proper discovery channels. A court order at this point is not what it is. And I appreciate the attorney for the professor protecting the professor's interests. You just can't do this. And you're not going to get to further harass the professor by getting all the discovery you can on her. Could you imagine the amount of harassment that could be levied when opening up someone's social media accounts to them. It's why when people harass others on the internet, they so often try to break into their social media accounts. <sighs> so I'm glad to see the judge just being like, what we're not gonna do. I appreciate this judge's level of patience mixed with sass, mixed with stern warnings. This judge feels like, this judge is giving I'm disappointed vibes, like I'm not mad now, but will be. So then we get a motion for summary judgment. This motion is 96 pages long. We are not, I don't think, going to get to all 96 of them, but we are going to get through a lot of it. Let's talk about this. I don't think I've covered a motion for summary judgment on the channel and if I have, it's been a really long time since I have. So let's, let's go to the MSJ. A motion for summary judgment is specific and different than like a motion to dismiss. So a motion to dismiss is brought by a defendant asking the court to dismiss allegations by the plaintiff. The court takes everything as true um, and in the light most favorable to the non-moving party. So when the defendant makes that motion to dismiss it, of course, the plaintiff doesn't want to dismiss their own case unless it's food court, and that's a separate topic. So the court looks at everything in the light most favorable to the plaintiff, and the court's like, I'm not saying these things will be proven down the line. I'm just saying on the four corners of this page, what's alleged here is enough to move forward. A motion for summary judgment is completely different because it's actually making legal determinations about the case in a way that can alter the way the case goes forward. And a motion for summary judgment, when granted, can knock out certain claims, can knock out part of the case, or can knock out the entire case before it ever reaches a jury. So it is a determinative filing to allow the court to make a ruling on facts, not on um, more basic assumptions, because it's much more determinative than that. Normally, there's no ability to refile to fix things. And in this case, it's the plaintiff filing for the MSJ. So let's take a look at what they are asking the court to legally determine, really as a matter of law, in this partial motion for summary judgment because some of these things are gonna be jury questions. It's a defamation case. Pursuant to the federal rules of civil procedure and local rules, plaintiff professor moves the court for partial summary judgment as to liability on each of her claims. Oh boy. They're asking the court to determine that TikToker as a matter of law defamed professor. 
I can't wait. This is my first look at this document because when I saw what it was about, I was like, we have to do this in real time. We have to do this together in real time. We cannot pre-read. We cannot pre-read. We have to do it. So, um, liability for defamation. This motion for partial summary judgment is supported by the memorandum in support. Professor Schofield's statement of undisputed material facts. Oh, oh. We have a statement from the professor and the declaration of the attorney and exhibits. Yay. Oh, we have all the things. We have all the things, people. Oh, boy. So if this is granted, if this is granted and then it goes to a jury, the jury will be asked to determine not whether or not defamation happened. And I think these are private figures. So it would be not even malice. It would be, it's been determined that TikToker defamed professor. You are here to determine essentially damages. Okay. Introduction. Plaintiff Rebecca Schofield respectfully requests that the court enter a summary judgment on both her claims against defendant as a matter of law and as a consequence of her failure to engage in this litigation as required by the federal rules. TikToker has attempted to defame professor. TikToker has admitted, wow, my brain read that so wrong, has admitted to defaming the professor. TikToker's admissions established beyond dispute that TikToker is liable for her defamation of professor. Accordingly, all that remains is for a jury to determine the extent of damages. I could have just kept reading. Background, factual history. In November 2022, four students at the University of Idaho were murdered at a home near campus, footnote one. Uh, and that goes on to say to respect the privacy of the victims and their family, they are referred to by their initials, KG, MM, X, K and EC. Gouillard, a resident of Texas, took this tragedy as an opportunity to post sensationalist content online to attract clicks and make money. I'm constantly disappointed that it doesn't say clicks and views. But that's just in my brain. I've been on the internet too long. <laughs> clicks and views. Um, but it is to attract clicks and make money. According to TikToker, she used her spiritual practice, psychic abilities, and metaphysical tools, including tarot cards, to post over 100 TikTok videos of her supposed quote-unquote findings concerning the murders near the university. Gouillard's purported findings, which she posted on the social media website TikTok, went like this. Professor Schofield had a same-sex affair with one of the victims and then planned, initiated, ordered, and executed the murder of the four University of Idaho students. Gouillard TikToker has admitted that she made these statements. She has admitted that these statements are false. See, generally, statement of undisputed material fact in support of the motion. We're going to get there. TikToker has admitted that her false statements are based on nothing more than her spiritual research, intuition, and instincts and that she has no written information or oral information from another human being to support her false statements. In a good faith attempt to resolve this matter without litigation and to avoid drawing further attention to TikTokers utterly baseless statements, Professor sent cease and desist letters, letters, to Gouillard on November 28th, 2022 and December 8th, 2022. TikToker received these letters and promptly disregarded them, instead choosing to continue spreading false information for her own pecuniary gain. Given Gouillard's, TikToker's, willful disregard of the cease and desist letters, the professor filed her complaint asserting two defamation claims, one relating to the false statements that the professor was involved in the murder, and two relating to the false statements that the professor was romantically involved with one of the victims. The factual history of this matter is set forth in more detail and concurrently filed SOF, which is incorporated herein for reference. That's down below. The professor filed her two count complaint December 21st. Gouillard TikToker failed to answer or otherwise respond within the time called for. The professor filed a motion for a clerk's entry of default on January 19th. The clerk's entry of default was filed January 27th. After failing to respond to the complaint and being found in default, 
TikToker filed a motion for relief of judgment and answer affirmative defenses and counterclaims on February 16th. Per, uh, professor responded by filing a motion for default judgment on February 17th and filed a motion to strike the answer affirmative defenses and counterclaims. On April 6th, the court issued a memorandum decision and order granting TikToker's motion to set aside the entry of default, granting Professor's motion to strike, and denying his moot Professor's motion for default. In granting TikToker's motion, the court reasoned that her, quote, failure to timely respond to plaintiff's complaint was most likely an unintentional oversight caused by self-serving carelessness. And that although the court did not condone it, such a failure did not amount to bad faith with an intention to take advantage of the opposing party, interfere with judicial decision making, or otherwise manipulate the legal process. Right. She just, the court was like, she just didn't take it seriously. TikToker then refiled her answer, affirmative defenses, and counterclaims on May 16th. On June 6th, the professor filed a motion to dismiss the counterclaims. The court heard argument on the motion to dismiss and issued a memorandum decision order dismissing the counterclaims on August 8th. On August 22nd, TikToker filed a motion to set aside the court's decision and order concerning the dismissal of her counterclaim, which remains pending. That's not gonna happen. Legal standard. Rule 56 provides that a party may move for summary judgment, identifying each claim or defense or the part of each claim or defense on which summary judgment is sought. The emphasized portion of the rule permits parties like the professor to move for summary judgment on liability while leaving the amount of damages for trial, which means literally this would go to trial and the jury would be told this person defamed this person. Now you have to decide the harm that it would cause. It might take two days. Maybe. The standard for summary judgment is familiar. Summary judgment is appropriate when Viewing evidence in the light most favorable to the non-moving party, there is no genuine dispute as to any material fact, which is why the material facts is what we're going to get into. TikToker's failure to respond to requests for admission conclusively establishes the material facts. Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 36A1 provides that a party may serve another party a written request to admit the truth of the matters within the scope of Rule 26B1. These are interrogatories relating to A, facts, the application of law or fact, and the opinions about either. B, the genuineness of any described documents. This is where the TikToker is in a pickle because I think that the TikToker is going to argue, and until the TikToker answers, I'm not going to get into this in depth, but I think the TikToker is going to argue these statements are true. And yes, I said them, but they're true. My defense is that it's true. The problem the TikToker is going to run into is that the TikToker has no evidence to prove and support the claim that these are true. So the TikToker necessarily, to assert the defense they want to defense, defend, because they can't say I didn't say it. I didn't say it's not a defense here. The only defense here is that it's not defamatory because it's true. And the TikToker by saying it's not defamatory because it's true is admitting that they're saying it. And this is the problem that they're going to run into because then you're going to have the court having to decide if there is any evidence that shows that this is true. And I think that the answer is going to be no, that all of the evidence shows that this is absolutely, as Nikki says in the chat, demonstrably false. Yes, Roy, I don't know how she's going to subpoena her spiritual advisors or higher or higher self. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how that's I don't know how that would work. Steph A said it's called self snitching. She's she's in a bind where her only possible defense as I see it based on publicly available facts is I said what I said because it's true. Some of this is based on the fact that I saw, saw, I listened to the court proceedings with her where she said to the court during that hearing, I said it because it's true. I believe, I believe it's true. Her belief that it's true isn't going to work, I don't think. So. You're allowed to pose interrogatories, questions under oath to other parties. It says, following the service 
of requests for admissions under Rule 36A, the party has 30 days to admit, deny, or object to request. If the responding party fails to timely respond, the matter is deemed admitted. A matter admitted under this rule is conclusively established unless the court on motion permits the admission to be withdrawn or amended. Guess, guess what's going to happen next? Now that this has been pointed out to TikTok, or I imagine that she is going to try to do this, but we'll see. The professor served TikToker with discovery requests, including requests for admission pursuant to the rule on June 20th, 2023. Accordingly, TikToker's responses to those requests were due no later than July 20th. Hey, that's my wedding anniversary. To date, TikToker has not responded to the requests. I don't think the court is going to allow her out of this one either. <sighs> because she did not respond. And it's deemed admitted. But it is going to determine liability. We have seen this in other cases where if you do not participate in the discovery process in, in, defamation, in a defamation case recently, if you do not participate in the process, the court can determine the issue of liability and leave it up to damages. It happened in the Alex Jones case. Professor Schofield has waited patiently for TikToker to respond, but two and a half months after her responses were due, TikToker has not responded. Lawyers will play the long game with you. Giving TikToker two and a half months, I think, is a strong legal play. Here's why. Because it's not jumping on this the moment it's not due. Being like, Your Honor, she didn't turn it in. It's like, Your Honor, she has had, and we have given her more than enough room beyond the deadline to show that this is a willful choice, not an oopsie. There is no whoopsie doodle here. Okay, Muffin? This is willful. This is, we gave you two and a half months past the deadline. The deadline gives you over a month, and you just didn't do it. If she doesn't do her assignment, I can't do mine. We were supposed to be talking about Haiti, and she is talking about some garden party. Uh, yes, thank you. That is the, the most appropriate clueless line ever. The effect of admission under Rule 36, whether an affirmative admission or deemed admission due to a failure to respond, is clear. Quote, a matter admitted under this rule is conclusively established. I think that it was also established in the phone call where she said, basically, or in the court hearing, basically, I said what I said. And it's true. And I believe it's true. Accordingly, concerning Professor Schofield's first claim for relief relating to TikTokers' false statements regarding the murders of the victims, the following facts have been conclusively established by the admissions and other evidence. TikTokers stated publicly that Professor was involved with the murders of the victims. Professor was not involved with the murders of the victims. The only basis for TikTokers' public statements that the professor was involved in the murders is TikToker's spiritual research, intuition, and instincts. She said this during the court hearing and in her motions. TikToker is not aware of any physical evidence linking professor to the murders. She said that during the court hearing when the court asked her directly. TikToker has no written information and has not received any information from another human being showing that the professor ever met uh, victim XK. TikToker has no written information, has not received any information orally from another human being showing professor ever met MM or EC. 
TikToker knew that the police department issued a press release on December 27th, stating that it did not believe that the female associate professor and chair of the history department who was suing a TikTok user for defamation is involved in this crime. And concerning professor's second claim for relief, the following material facts have been established. TikToker publicly stated professor had an affair with KG. Professor did not have an affair with KG. The only basis for TikToker's statement that the professor had an affair with KG was TikToker's spiritual research, intuition, and instincts. TikToker is not aware of any physical evidence showing that that affair happened. Facts conclusively established by TikToker's admissions demonstrate the professor's entitlement to a judgment as a matter of law. In a defamation action, a plaintiff must prove that the defendant communicated information concerning the plaintiff to others, that the information was defamatory, and that the plaintiff was damaged because of the communication. A defamatory statement is one that tends to harm a person's reputation by subjecting the person to public contempt, disgrace, or ridicule, or by adversely affecting the person's business. Moreover, the Idaho Supreme Court has recently held that a statement is defamatory per se if it imputes to another conduct cons constituting a criminal offense. This is the case in most states that when you accuse someone of committing crimes, and I would say because this gets thrown around on the internet a lot, if you accuse people of being predatory against minors, and that is not true, that would also be, you know, accusing people of crimes. When you accuse people of crimes publicly, you can find yourself very quickly in the defamation per se world. And in the world of defamation per se, you don't have to prove damages per se. You just have to prove that the thing was said and that the thing is a crime. Murder is a crime. Accusing someone of murder is accusing someone of committing a crime. So this first claim falls under defamation per se. Um, other states broaden this. In Georgia, accusing someone of having a communicable illness or a communicable disease also falls under defamation per se. Accusing someone of adultery in numerous states is also considered defamation per se. Um, if the offense imputed is of a type which, if committed in the place of publication, would be A, punishable by imprisonment in a state or federal institution, B, regarded by public opinion as involving moral turpitude. Murder's going to fit. Under this test, the proper focus of a, a defamation, and Valkyrie Arts said, to be fair, cheating is bad. I don't think the housewives realize how much um, accusing someone of stepping out on their marriage can be defamation per se. Because in a lot of states, accusing someone of adultery is defamation per se. And, and that shit's a plot line in almost every franchise all the time. Under this test, the proper focus of defamation per se inquiry is the nature of the conduct imputed. If criminal conduct is imputed, accusing someone of murder and the conduct amounts to either a crime punishable by imprisonment or a crime of moral turpitude, the allegedly defamatory remarks are actionable as defamation per se. Oh, calling somebody a fraud might fit under this as well. Interesting. Similarly, a statement is defamatory per se if it ascribes to another conduct, characteristics, or a condition that would adversely affect their fitness for the proper conduct of their lawful business trade or profession. This is where the second part comes in. Because if you're ascribing conduct that would adversely affect your profession, that falls into defamation per se. And accusing someone of having an affair with a student, I think would fall into this. Um, that's the second restatement of torts. Or, imputes serious sexual misconduct to another. 
just to put a bow on it. Um, this is case law recognizing that statements are defamatory per se if they impute to the plaintiff either a criminal offense, a loathsome disease, C.E.G. Cardi B. Tasha K., a matter incompatible with his trade, business profession, or office, or serious sexual misconduct. So I, I think what is considered a loathsome disease maybe is changing, but here we go. Emily said, question, I thought defamation per se was just accusing someone of criminal conduct. We are, Emily, this is a great question, but right now we are defining defamation per se in Idaho. The reason you are looking at defamation per se versus def defamation is because you don't have to prove damages. So you don't have to say, I was defamed and then lost this job or lost this money. You just have to say, I was defamed. The damage is assumed because the things said are so damaging. The things said are assumed to be damaging. So defamation and defamation per se are different because defamation requires you to prove damages. Defamation per se for liability, you don't have to prove damages. You prove damages to be awarded damages later. But in a defamation case, you have to prove damages as a part of liability. Someone's not liable for defamation if they can't prove that they were harmed. It's like, okay, they said that, but were you harmed? What was the damage done to you? Which is why a lot of times, especially on the internet, you see people saying, okay, well, this person said this thing that's not true about that person. Why didn't that person sue? And if it doesn't fall under defamation per se, and they can't prove damages, that might be why they don't. Um, admissions made under Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 36, even default admissions can serve as the factual predicate for summary judgment. Alice, this is exactly it. Defamation, but did you die? Um, Leah Remini's case has a lot of damages in it. Also defamation per se in it. Indeed, because evidence inconsistent with a Rule 36 admission is properly excluded, summary judgment may be granted solely based on Rule 36 admissions, even where the evidence might contradict those admissions. Footnote three. To be clear, there is no evidence contradicting Gouillard's admissions here. Professor Schofield is entitled to judgment as a matter of law on count one. Count one concerns TikTokers' false and defamatory statements that the professor was involved with the murders of the victims, in particular beginning on or about November 24th. Uh, TikToker posted videos on TikTok in which she falsely stated the professor was responsible for, ordered, or was otherwise involved in the four student deaths. TikToker publishing of these videos on TikTok constitutes a communication as a matter of law. Because the statements impute criminal conduct for which the punishment is greater than one year in prison, the statements are defamatory per se. Accordingly, professor is entitled to summary judgment on count one. This is going to count two. TikToker admitted that she publicly stated professor was involved with the murders of four students. This admission conclusively establishes that Gouillard communicated information concerning the plaintiffs to others. While few cases dwell on what it means to communicate information concerning the plaintiff to others, there is no doubt that posting videos on TikTok satisfies this element. I agree. And we're going to move on. Even absent the admission, there can be no dispute that she communicated information concerning the professor to others. Beginning on or about November 24th, she posted on TikTok videos to her account in which she falsely stated both directly and indirectly that the professor was responsible for, involved in, and ordered the murder of the four students. Over the following days, TikToker posted additional TikToks in which she continued to falsely assert that the professor ordered, planned, ordered and planned the murder of the four students. These TikToks put more details into the false theory. And TikToker claimed that the professor and a different student at the university together planned the murders. Footnote four. As with plaintiff's complaint, this memorandum uses the initials of JD to protect the individual's privacy and not perpetuate TikToker's false and defamatory statements. That individual has not sued, and that might be a decision because of money. This is not inexpensive to do. And oftentimes, if the head if the name's already out there in the headlines, for for law nerds, for y'all, because y'all are nuanced and smart 
and curious, you ask questions, you know that headlines are often bullshit and things are allegations and shade. A lot of you see beyond just the headlines. But for a lot of people, they saw the headline and then moved on and never dive this deep for when these things resolve a year or two or more later. We're coming up on a year since these statements were made. When these things resolve a year and or more later, most people who heard the original defamatory statement, especially on the internet, have that kind of lodged in their brain and don't know that it ever resolved another way. I think with these statements, a lot of people were like, what? Also, y'all, thank you for the gifted memberships. Chat, I see you guys gifting, gifting it up. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Rosebud. Thank you, Villainess Cupcake. I love that. Thank you, Leela. There were more. There were more here. Um, let me find them real quick. So thank you, everybody who gifted memberships. All of you that are new members are going to have a lot of access to behind the scenes of Bra the Bravo -E Con. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bridget, for gifting 10 memberships earlier in the stream. It's very much appreciated, chat. It's a great way to support this community. And I thank you. It's very kind. We focus on the good part of the internet up in here, up in here, as opposed to the ridiculous. Eric, thank you so much for the gift of memberships. Focusing on the positive, not the nonsense. We're just going to have to keep evaluating the nonsense because I think it helps. I think it helps. I think all of us are just like, what in the world is this? Absolutely wild. I'm so invested. I'm so invested in this lawsuit. Nobody is still covering it, I don't think. I am so invested in it. I am so invested in it. I I just am I just am. I want to see this resolve. Like there is a there is something so unjust about what was done to this professor that it like strikes at my core. Like it just, it's not the fact that anyone can say anything on the internet and have it go viral is is a tough push pull with free speech anyone can say anything it doesn't mean there's not consequences like a lawsuit but often by the time that those consequences catch up the damage is already done and that's part of the part of the difficulty in cases like this the damage can be done for years before it ever gets unwound and even then it might not ever get unwound for everyone all right let's continue Um, in one of her November 28th TikToks, TikToker included text saying, I don't care what y'all say. JD and Schofield killed the victims. Rebecca, professor, was the one to initiate the plan and hired JD. In all, TikToker herself estimates that she posted over 100 TikTok videos of her findings supposed findings in which she communicated her baseless theory that the professor was in a relationship with victim KG that broke up and that she initiated the murders, planned the murders and hired JD to help carry the plan out. Gouliard has continued to make defamatory statements even after the professor's cease and desist letters since December 1st, TikToker has posted additional TikToks. This is December 1st, 2022. TikToker has posted additional TikToks stating, among other things, that the professor is going to prison for the murder of the four University of Idaho students, whether you like it or not. And, oh, my mouse just froze. And I'm not worried about professor suing me because she will be using her resources to fight for murder cases. And she, I have no idea what's happening outside my house. It is so loud. Hopefully you can't hear it. And she ordered the execution and murders of the four victims. Moreover, the TikToks were in fact viewed by thousands, if not millions of people. Some of her TikToks defaming the professor had thousands of likes indicating that a third party had viewed the video and liked it. 
TikToker's admissions and this evidence establishes beyond dispute that she communicated information about the professor to others. I don't disagree. What I do disagree with is why my mouse has stopped working. Hold on. Hold on. Miguelina, I can't even change. Can you put me back on the screen? We need to put some music on real quick while I try to fix this because um, because my, my mouse. Because my mouse is not mousing. So we're going to have to... I have to find a charging cable, I think. I think it's dead. Thank you, Miguelina. I can't do anything. I have no control. I have no control until I find a cable. See how fast we can do this. Doesn't it normally give you a warning? (laughs) Like, don't, doesn't it normally say like, hey girl, danger. Danger! Your mouse is about to die. Also, why isn't this USB C? Like, I need it to be USB C. We need need to do that again. We need throw that beat down one more time. Oh, streaming! It's always an adventure. I love you guys. You guys are the best. I'm not the best. Hold on. Ah, We can do this. Success. Thank you, Mikalina. <laughs> this mouse does not flash before it dies because it has no light. It probably tells me somewhere. Oh, we're back. We're back. We're back in a- we're back in action. Back in back. <laughs> we're professionals, people. Professionals! Thank you, Mikalina. <laughs> Oh goodness me. Let us continue. We needed we needed a minute. I can't I can't imagine the distress this would cause when something like this has rocked your university and and then you're being accused of doing it and and on social media where you have no when you're accused of something on social media, there's no process until you take it to court. If you're accused in a court of law, there is a process for either being convicted or proving your innocence. But when you are accused in the court of public opinion, there's not a ton you can do other than perhaps sue for defamation. It's crazy. It's crazy. Tara, when you hit a million subscribers, can we do more ASMR? I owe you guys like two of them that I have not done. So yes, I owe I owe you some. I owe you some dramatic ASMR readings of, of historic documents. Lisa R said, I found out I passed the DC bar today. Your streams helped me understand and reinforce some concepts. Yes, Lisa. Hold on. We need a whole... Congratulations. That is a huge accomplishment. Big congrats. And I hope studying wasn't too painful. All right, us. All right, us. All right, us. Let's get back. Let's get back, law nerds. Let's get back to this. Let us, let us continue on. So they assert that the TikToks were viewed by thousands, if not millions. I don't disagree. We've seen defamation cases where a text message to another person communicating something is considered enough of a publication to one other person especially with defamation per se. A text between two parties talking about a third party can be defamation per se if you accuse that person of criminal behavior or something else that falls under those defamation per se statutes, like cheating on a spouse in a lot of states. I need to look if that counts in Utah. I bet it does. Um, Gouillard's communications were defamatory per se. The statements unambiguously impute to to the professor conduct constituting a criminal offense. Yes. Indeed, TikToker admitted she stated publicly that the professor was involved with the murders. TikToker's admissions and uncontroverted evidence in this case establish that TikToker's statements impute to professor conduct constituting a criminal offense. We we don't need to dive into that further. I think that's established. Professor Schofield is entitled to a judgment as the matter of law on count two. As with count one, 
the admissions established by a matter of law that the professor is entitled to judgment on count two. TikTok are admitted to posting TikToks containing assertions that the professor was in a romantic relationship with one of the victims and that um, admitted that those assertions were false and admitted she had no evidence to support those assertions. Those were communicated to others on TikTok. The statements that the professor maintained a romantic relationship with a student are defamatory as a matter of law because they harm a person's reputation by subjecting the person to public contempt, disgrace, or ridicule, or adversely affecting the person's business. In addition to statements imputing criminal conduct, the Idaho Supreme Court has recognized three other categories of statements that are defamation per se and do not require proof of special damages. Um, utterances that ascribe to another conduct characteristics or conditions incompatible with the proper conduct of a lawful business or trade. And with a teacher, I think that's where that's going to fall. Um, they go through and line that out. I don't think we need to line it out. Imputing that a professor is having an illicit affair with a student, I think imputes their um, ability to do their profession. I don't think there's argument on that. The University of Idaho has implemented policies for a good reason. A romantic or sexual relationship of any of the kind forbidden by the policy inevitably raises concerns for objectivity, fairness, and exploitation because they have the potential for abuse and damaging consequences. The imbalance of power creates unacceptable risks of exploitation, favoritism, harassment, and bias, both actual and perceived, and thereby impairs the integrity of the professional relationship and trust on which it depends. So that's going into the university's policies. Um, there's a study on this? Huh. The University of Idaho is not alone in adopting such policies prohibiting romantic relationships between professors and students. A 2014 study found that 84% of the American universities surveyed had some prohibitions on professor-student relationships. What's wrong with sex between professors and students? It's not what you think, courtesy of the New York Times. Okay. The policies, in, I mean, I'm saying okay because I'm like, do does everything need to be studied? I mean, I guess so. Maybe it needs to be said, like, don't do that. Why does it need to be said, though? It seems like don't do that. I guess the obvious needs to be said. Mm -hmm. These policies, including the University of Idaho's indisputable indisputably demonstrate that romantic or sexual relationships between professors and students at the same university are incompatible with the proper conduct of the professor's lawful business, trade, or profession. Accordingly, because TikTok are admitted to making such statements, they too are defamatory per se. And then it lines out more what's imputed. Conclusion, for the reasons stated herein, the professor respects that the court grant the motion for summary judgment. Let's go to the exhibities. That is the end of the motion. I think it is well taken for me. Lindsay, this is a good point. Common sense isn't that common. Um, what we've seen this motion for summary judgment line out is the... Um, Statements for both counts fall under defamation per se. The statements were communicated on TikTok. And because the TikToker has failed to respond to the request for admissions, they are legally deemed admitted. But also the TikToker has admitted them outside of that as well in statements on the record to the court during argument. So there's more. Um, So, plaintiff's statement of undisputed facts. This is, let's see, this should be the professor's. St uh, this is the statement of undisputed facts from the uh, professor and lawyers. Sorry to zoom zoom on you. Let's go through this. Oh, I didn't even have it up. Me. We need to, we need to, good Lord. that okay professor professor is an associate professor of history and the department chair at the university of idaho defendant is a resident of texas professor served defendant tiktoker with discovery requests including requests for admissions 
under the federal rules. TikToker's response to those requests were due July 20th. To date, has not responded. TikToker has never been to the state of Idaho. And if you had a lawyer, that would have been litigated as a central part of the early litigation in this case. But TikToker has never been to Moscow, Idaho. In the early morning, morning hours of November 13th, four students were murdered in a home near campus. Professor did not personally know any of the victims. At the time of the murders, the professor was not in Idaho. On or around November 22nd, 2022, TikToker began uploading and posting videos to TikTok addressing the murders at the university. In her TikToks posted on or about November 24th, TikToker made numerous statements that the professor was involved in the murders of the victims. In a TikTok post on November 26th, TikToker stated that there were two people who partnered to kill the four students, Professor and JD. In a TikTok post on November 28th, TikToker said, I don't care what y'all say, JD and Rebecca killed the victims. Rebecca was the one who initiated the plan and hired JD. In a TikTok post on November 28th, TikToker stated that Rebecca Schofield's decision to have the students kill was based on her connection to one of the students, KG. In a post on November or on December 1st, 2022, TikToker stated she was not worried about the professor suing her. She ordered the execution, the murder of the four students. On December 2nd, TikToker stated that professor is going to prison, whether you like it or not, for killing four students. <sighs> TikToker's statements that the professor was involved in the murders were false. TikToker admitted that her statements that the professor was involved in the murders were false. The only basis for TikToker's statements uh, that the professor was involved in the murder was the TikToker's spiritual research, intuition, and instincts. TikToker was not aware of any physical evidence linking professor to the murders. TikToker has no written information, did not receive any information orally from another human being that showed that the professor ever met the victims. I love that they're clarifying from another human being. Just, just to make it clear that we're not talking about anything other than another person telling you things. Angela in the chat asked, and people still watch this TikToker. I believe this TikToker has been taken off the platform and I don't think has been able to return to the platform. I think they attempted to ban evade is my memory, but I believe they have been permanently, permanently um, removed from the platform. The University of Idaho has no records of the victims ever being enrolled in a class taught by the professor. In her TikToks, defendant made numerous statements that the professor was romantically involved with KG, one of the victims in this case. In a post on November 28th, TikToker stated that defendant, uh, that sorry, professor and student's connection is the reason that the professor ordered the murder. In a post on December 5th, defendant stated that, uh, Professor was being a sugar mama to the victim and that the pair were on a break and that during the break, the professor was worried about being caught. And that's when she started planning the victim's murder. On December 5th, TikToker stated that the professor's relationship with victim was filling the professor's need for a woman. In a TikTok posted on November 25th, 2022, TikToker stated that there was a specific university policy that the professor was worried about violating if people found out she was dating a victim. Not to mention the um, distress that this was going to cause the victim's family. Like, it, uh... TikToker's statements that the professor was romantically involved with KG were false. TikToker has admitted that the statements that the professor was romantically involved uh, that's a typo. That should be KG with KG or false. The only basis for TikToker's statements that the professor was romantically involved with KG was the spiritual research, intuition, and instincts. TikToker has no physical evidence showing a romantic relationship. The TikTok account had thousands of followers and some of the TikToks defaming the professor had thousands of likes indicating that third parties had viewed the videos and liked it. The following crimes are punishable by imprisonment. Um, solicitation of a crime, accessory of a crime, 
and then they line that out. On November 28th, 2022, plaintiff's counsel sent cease and desist, notifying TikToker that she had made false and defamatory statements on TikTok and demanding she remove all such false defamatory statements and cease from making or publishing similar TikToks and false statements. TikToker read and received and read the letter. Yeah, because she talked about it on TikTok. Nevertheless, TikToker continued to state publicly that the professor was involved with the murders and that the professor had an affair with one of the victims. On December 8th, a second cease and desist was sent. Um, the same as the first. TikToker received and read the letter, continued to publicly post the same shit. On December 27th, the police department issued a press release. That's how bad it got. It got to the point where the police department had to make a press release saying that they do not believe that the professor being accused on TikTok is involved in the crime. And this is before the arrest of Brian Koberger. Ashley, this is a very good point. I do forget common sense isn't common because I only talk to chat where common sense is abundant. I talk to chat and my friends where common sense is abundant and that's why chat is the best. They are, chat is bae. Chat is bae. It's like chat, my husband and Judge Abby. <laughs> oh, there are others, there are others, but you know, the most people I talk to in a given day is chat. The university maintains a staff handbook. These are the policies in the handbook. The policies say don't do that. Um, a University of Idaho professor found to have violated the policy is considered to have committed unprofessional conduct. This is going to that defamation per se. Yes, and banned parents. And a lot of banned parents were banned kids. So, you know, there's that. Um... Policy 3205 further provides that a romantic or sexual relationship of the kind forbidden by the policy inevitably raises concern for the objectivity, fairness, and exploitation because there's a potential risk for abuse. All right, so those are the statements of fact. This is the declaration of the um, lawyer going through all of the statements and attaching the press release, the TikToks, and all the rest of it. So this is attaching the evidence. Exhibit A is the plaintiff's first set of interrogatories. These are the questions that were sent to the defendant. Those are the definitions in the interrogatories. We're just going to look at those real quick, and then I'm going to get to questions. Instructions. This lays out how to answer the interrogatories. General production format. How to turn over the interrogatories very much lined out this is what this is what's being requested and this is what you need to do so all the rules for the interrogatories and document requests and here we get to the interrogatories the last time i think we looked at interrogatories were with regard to the britney spears case we were looking at some of the admission requests for admissions um please identify witnesses that have knowledge or purports to have knowledge of the facts related to the matters. Does any, has anyone told you these things? Does anyone else know? Identify person you expect to call as a witness. Identify um, every statement you have made that plaintiff had an affair with a victim. Identify every statement that you have made that plaintiff was involved with the murders. Identify the number of times somebody has viewed a TikTok or YouTube video, where in the video you state that the plaintiff had an affair. I don't know if they're even gonna be able to do that. Here's the problem with the internet. I mean, one of the things is that these things have now been re-uploaded to other places. So while TikToker might be able to go to TikToker's account and be like, these are the metrics in the back end of my account, maybe harder for TikTok because if their TikTok account is closed, you might not be able to get those uh, short of subpoenaing TikTok. But um, to get those types of analytics, you're only going to get them to the native videos. You're not going to get them to the to the reuploads or the comments or the stitches or the reshares or the YouTube videos that has put them into YouTube videos to give comment on them. You're not going to get to um, everyone who's seen them because they've 
spread across the internet, though, at least on YouTube, you can kind of see the view count. I mean, on TikTok, you can kind of see the view count too. And But trying to find everything that's been stitched for the plaintiffs could be difficult. Trying to find every commentary video could be difficult. Identify the number of times somebody has viewed a TikTok or YouTube video where in the video you state the plaintiff was involved in the murders. Identify email, TikTok accounts, um, and other platforms you have used to make statements. So these are all very normal interrogatories. Identify the factual basis for your contention that the plaintiff had an affair with a victim. Please identify the factual basis for your contention plaintiff was involved in the murders. Identify the date when you first said plaintiff communicated with Brian Koberger. Identify the content of the communications you contend occurred between plaintiff and Koberger. Identify the date when you said plaintiff had access to a white Hyundai Elantra. Identify all reporters that you made a statement to about plaintiff. Identify how much money you have made related to your statements about the affair and the murders. If you deny any of the requests for admission propounded herein, or if your response is anything but an unqualified admission for each denial or partial denial set forth in full detail the denial. Request for production, all exhibits you intend to use all documents you intend to use, um, all documents and communications, including TikTok videos, YouTube videos, blog posts, social media posts, et cetera. All documents that you contend prove the plaintiff had an affair. All documents you, you, you contend prove that plaintiff was involved in the murders. All documents that show how much money you made. Um, all communications about this litigation you have sent and received, unless it with a lawyer, but probably not seeing that she's still representing herself. Um, all right, request for admission. Admit that you stated publicly that Professor had an affair with victim. Admit that you stated publicly that Professor was involved in the murders of the victims. Admit that plaintiff did not have an affair with victim. Admit that plaintiff was not involved in the murders of the victims. Admit that the only basis for your statement is your spiritual research. So these requests for admissions were never answered. So all of these are deemed admitted by law. I wonder how the TikToker received that information when they were received with this. Um, request for admission, admit that you have never been to Moscow, admit that you've never been to Idaho, admit that you are not aware of any physical evidence linking plaintiff in the murders or any physical evidence showing plaintiff had an affair, admit that you never said Admit that you never said plaintiff communicated with Kobergers about the murders until after Koberger was arrested on December 30th. Admit that you never said plaintiff had access to a white Hyundai Elantra until after law enforcement stated they were looking for information on a white Hyundai Elantra in relation to the murders on December 7th. Admit that you never communicated with uh, JD. Admit that you never communicated with Brian Koberger. Unless she did. Admit that you have no written information showing plaintiff ever met Victims um, admit that you not have not received any information showing that plaintiff ever met victims, and this goes on and on. We've already gone through most of these because they're in the undisputed facts because these are all deemed as admitted. Um, there should be a, here's the cease and desist. TikToker, I represent Professor. You have made false and defamatory statements. Remove them. Um, and then they go through the rest of the cease and desist. Not being thrilled that this is happening. Your false statements continue constitute defamation per se. They're false, made with knowledge of falsity. And then it goes through that. Please confirm that you'll take these steps immediately. Uh, this is a second cease and desist. The follow-up. As you know, we represent Professor. You have made... Multiple false and defamatory statements. On November 28th, we sent you by email cease and desist, demanding you immediately cease and desist. Instead, you knowingly published additional defamatory statements, rep repeating your previous false statements and making additional false statements. A copy of the November 28th cease and desist is enclosed. Considering your failure to immediately remove previously published TikToks containing false and defamatory statements, and considering your publication of additional defamatory statements, the professor intends to file a defamation lawsuit against you. 
If following your receipt of this letter, you do not immediately remove the tic defamatory TikToks and cease and desist from additional statements, professor about the professor, the amount of damages the professor will seek to recover will increase substantially. Professor has been patient and provided opportunities for you to cease and desist and to publicly correct your false statements. Your ongoing conduct is harmful to her, her reputation, her family. I look forward to hearing that you have complied. Well, that's not what happened. This is the press release. At this time in the investigation, detectives do not believe the female associate professor and chair of the history department at the university suing a TikToker use, user for defamation is involved in this crime. The police department will not provide a statement about the ongoing civil process. The fact that law enforcement had to had to state publicly that they did not believe the statements being made on TikTok is bananas. And so these are all exhibits that are provided on flash drives. Those are all the TikToks that the judge will now watch. Um, and I think that's going to get us through all of the uh, exhibits. So with that, I'm going to answer some questions before I have to hop off on time today. I know. Well, what is on time anyway? Oh, wait, there's pictures. Hold on. Once there's photos, we're going to the photos. Yeah, we're going to go to the photos. Because we're going to the photos. Um, that's the statement they were talking about. Professor is going to prison for the murder of four University of Idaho students. Uh, this user's name was under... This was a different one, I think. Um because there were two accounts with different handles. Oh, only the one declaration of Schofield. So this is the declaration of the professor. This is what I was looking for. Just kidding. We're going to do this. Associate professor in, in late 2022, I was informed that a person I later learned was defendant was posting videos on TikTok in which the defendant claimed I was romantically involved with victim KG, a student at the university. Also in late 2022, I learned that TikToker was posting videos in which defendant TikToker claimed I was involved in the murders of the students. The statements are false. I have never been in Ah! No! I aggressively moused. Hold on. We're going to have to try to figure out where we were. Oh, I'm so mad at my own user error. All right, let's get back. I just wanted to go through the professor's declaration. I wanted to see if it said affiant. <laughs> affiant further saith not. It, do it doesn't. It doesn't. All right. We were so, we were so close. If I run out of time, which is happening immediately, I will cover the Oklahoma texting judge on Thursday. Yeah, we need to. We we need to just chat about it. Um, so I will. All right. Let's see. Where was I? Gouillard's statements are false. Never been in a romantic relationship uh, with a student. Never been in a relationship with that student. Was not involved in the murders. Did not plan the murders. Have never met the victims. Never taught the victims did not personally know the victims, was not in Idaho when it occurred, was in Portland, Oregon, visiting friends with my husband. Um, we checked out from our hotel in Portland the morning of November 13th. After the murders had been committed, we did not arrive back in Idaho until well after it had been discovered and reported. Attached as Exhibit A is a true copy of the faculty policy regarding uh, relations with students. Exhibit B is another policy regarding students. I declare under penalty of perjury under the laws of the United States that the foregoing is true and correct. I prefer further affiant saith not. I declare under penalty of perjury. It just seems so boring. Just seems so boring. <sighs> this, this whole case makes me so sad. It's, it's frustrating, it's sad, but it shows how difficult it can be to fight false statements online. It is a difficult 
it's a difficult problem. And I think people know that, especially when they're like, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to me? Are you going to sue me? And we've seen that attitude come up online over and over and over again. And then when the professor is like, yes, I'm going to sue you, they're just like, fine, spend your money. What are you going to do to me? And if they don't have a lot of assets to go over, the professor could very realistically win this case and still recover nothing and be out of the money that it cost to try to clear their name. But the thing that frustrates me with that too is if and when the professor wins this case, will there ever be a headline reporting it to start to counteract the rest of the headlines? Or will it be another year on from now, two years from when the statements were made and it just kind of moves on? We'll see. We'll see. All right, it's time to do a very quick speed run of questions. Nikki says it's so upsetting because it could happen to any of us. Yes. And what and what do you do when it happens? And what is the good result? I mean, this is the same thing with parts of the Toddy Westbrook case. What do you do? You try to deal with it the best you can. Um, let's see. There was another statement that I wanted to pull up. MB said the professor should be given a huge amount of money. If if this um, summary judgment is granted and then liabilities uh, settled and this goes to trial for damages, even if the professor is awarded money, how do you recover it? And where do you recover it from? TikToker talks about running an apartment, so there's not a house you're going to go over. Like, what assets are you going to go after? And we're seeing Cardi B still dealing with this and chasing assets from Tasha K. It's a whole separate litigation procedure to actually get paid. You can win an award, but to actually get paid that award is a whole separate litigation procedure that also costs a lot of money. I don't know if Cardi B is ever going to see any money because she's going to continue to fight for it. But if the TikToker does not have any assets to pay over, what do you do? The, re the, the response is money judgment. Yes, you could do an injunction. Yes, you could try to garnish any earnings from social media, I suppose. So it's tough. Um, is there a crime victims fund? Most states have crime victims fund, but it wouldn't count in this case. This is a civil matter. Um, we know attorney Olson has press contacts. I see a silver lining there. Yeah, it might get covered if they win because attorney Olson is representing the media coalition in the cases, um, in the murder case dealing with the media having access to the courtroom. Astronaut asks, can the family of the deceased victim and boyfriend named also civilly sue this TikToker? If the family, not as much, because the statements weren't made about the family and the family's not harmed, could the estate of the victim sue? I don't even know if it would be worth it for them. I don't know if they need to. Um, could the boyfriend civilly sue? I mean, it at, to what end? Again, the the conversation I would have is, is this what you want to spend your money on for the next two years to fight this out in court with someone who potentially won't even be able to pay it, won't settle it with you, and is just going to make this miserable? To what end? So could the boyfriend also sue for the things said about them? Probably. Is that a choice they would want to make? Uh, Steph A, isn't it a felony to file a false police report regarding her psychic intuition on the plaintiff, or did the TikToker just submit it to Crime Stoppers? The TikToker said that they submitted it to Crime Stoppers and called the police department and were like, I have a tip to the other tip line. Um, and you're allowed to make tips at the tip line. To the point that the police department came out and said, we don't think these things are connected. Interlocution 
Law Nerd Shop is fantastic. Got my Bring the Jury mug in less than a week from order to delivery at my door. App made it so easy. Mug rocks. Thank you so much. The mugs are good. I hope you got the, the big one. Hold on. Ah, my big one is stuck. This one. It's so good. They're so big. I love them so much, but they are like big, cozy mugs. Um, could Koberger use this TikToker's BS as a defense tactic? Oh, gosh. I don't even see how that would come up and be permissible evidence. Like, I, I don't see how that would come up and be permissible evidence at all. Um, are you doing a BravoCon meet and greet? Yes, I am doing one with the Bravo docket. I'll put the details in the app um, as we get closer. But yes, we are doing one in Vegas. Um, do I remember the day off the top of my head? No, but I will put that information in the app for anyone interested. Her lawyer is the tarot deck judgment card. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Lindsay said, the court really said, saith further not. Exactly. <laughs> Affiant saith further not. I got it backwards. I'm dyslexic. Thank you so much, Emily, for answering my questions. This is so sad. You're welcome. It is. Um, this is the conundrum that we fall into with free speech. We are allowed to say things. Um, but when does that speech cross into the line, cross the lines of harassment? When does that speech cross the lines of of defamation? But the thing is, you have to say it first, and then there's a consequence. It doesn't stop people from doing the harm. So there's that. Um, I don't know what the I saw a couple questions about could this not be criminal harassment? They didn't choose to pursue it that way, and I don't know what the cyber harassment laws in Idaho look like. I have not looked. Um, getting banned off the platform, getting banned off a of TikTok is a consequence for that. Like the when we look at the um the responsibility of social media platforms and where that falls within policies of harassment and speech and and the balance between the two with private companies, these aren't these aren't easy things to tackle. And I, I appreciate that these are not easy things to tackle. It just does so much damage. It's why it's so frustrating looking at it going, this does so much damage. How is there not a better solution? Um, her YouTube has an update for the case. Susie, what? Hold on. Um, I... Don't here. Let me see if I can find uh find that. I'll have to go look down the road. Um, let's see. I will have to go look at their channel. Their channel still has this stuff up. I don't want to send people, I don't want to send people to the channel because if it's monetized, it's just gonna make it work. Uh just going to make it worse. So We'll see. I'll go look. I'll go seek that out later and then let you guys know um, what I think about that. But I will go look for that. But there's there is definitely still stuff up on their channel about this case. Um, so I will look in a little bit. But thank you for that. That will give me something to go look for later today. Um. Rico, question, hypothetically, if there were Facebook messages between the professor and the students, wouldn't that support TikToker's defense against the defamation claim tenements regarding their affair? Yes, but the TikToker didn't ask for that. They asked for all Facebook messages, all Instagram messages. These things have to be narrowly tailored within request for discovery. Because if somebody asks you specifically, Provide all Facebook messages between you and any of these four victims during this like period of time when the victims would have been at the university. That is a tailored response. And then it allows the professor to say, here there are or there are none. It allows for an answer. But just provide all social media messages of everything you can't answer. So yes, the hypothetical is a great question. That's not what was asked for. 
So I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm obsessed with your earrings. Thank you. I like them too. They are fun. Um, I have them in multiple colors. I have them in black and silver. I have them in diamonds. <laughs> I love them. So thank you. Uh, they are Kendra Scott. I got a Pacer Monitor account because of this case. <laughs> Grizel, it's it's just so it's I'm so deeply invested in this case. Taking a break from my rewatch of the Murdoch trial to watch this live. I'm now on day 24 in the morning. All three of my pawn nerds say hi to their favorite voice to listen to. Hello, Nicole's pawn nerds. Be good. Lots of cuddles. Um, let's see. Mountain time is in line with Pacific time during daylight savings. Once we go back to standard time, the mountain time will line up with central. And that happens in just a few weeks, I think, when we go back to standard time. Can the designated media use their own equipment? There's a pool camera, so they can only use the pool camera. So there is one camera allowed in Idaho. Potential food court lawsuit involving Panera. I've gotten a bunch of DMs about that, so I have it on my radar. It is on my radar. Taking a break from a... Re we just got to this one. I love that. Uh, sick today, antibiotics. I'm sorry. Feel better, Emily. One year anniversary of being a member. Yay! The app is awesome. Thanks for setting it up. You're welcome. My team did a lot of work to get the app up and running well. Um, I'm so, so proud of them. So proud of them. So why did TikToker target this professor? From what I have seen in the court documents and what the TikToker said in response to the court at the court hearing that I attended virtually, they were looking at the university's website at the professors and inquired intuitively and was intuitively led to the history department and then was intuitively led to this professor. And while I believe listening to your intuition is a very good thing, I think we all know sometimes, you know, sometimes, you know, things. I don't think that these are things that you can place out there on the internet without having proof, even if it's what you think is going on. Because if you are wrong, it's defamatory. And if you have nothing to back it up with, it's going to be defamatory. And it's unethical and tremendously damaging. Even if you think it, even if you're like, mm, look at the tea. It also, to me, adds insult to injury to all of the victims in this case. It, it also can be very damaging for the families having to have all of this swirling on social media while they still at the time still didn't have answers for what was going on to their children. And that's part of what makes this case so frustrating. It's not just saying, oh, somebody's lipstick is fuzzy or oh, this and this and that. It's not tea. It's a quadruple homicide that was an open case at the time. It's, it's, it's just, it's appalling. And that's, I think, part of why this case kind of strikes a nerve with me. Um, there's a difference between the things you know and then the things you are going to put on the internet and use to promote yourself and your business and try to make money off of. It's it's a difficult case and it's a frustrating case. So, all right. With all of it, y'all, I have got to go. Um, it's just, it's so, it's so difficult, this case. But I am late, so I have got to roll. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being honored. Tomorrow we're talking about Taylor Swift and Ticketmaster. The Ticketmaster fuckery is, it is next level Ticketmaster fuckery. Next level Ticketmaster fuckery. So that is tomorrow's podcast. I will be back with a stream on Thursday. Schedule gets a little squishy after that. Make sure that you're following along in the app. So even when the schedule gets a little squishy, you don't miss anything over at lawnardapp.com. And with that, thank you all who gifted memberships. Thank you for the super chats. You guys are an amazing community. I adore you. 
Thank you for having nuanced conversations with me about difficult things on the internet so that hopefully we can figure out how to navigate this world that we live in. I will talk to you in the next one. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the app store for Lawnerd. You can also follow me around social media and don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a Lawnerd. Nerd.